Hi everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Sora Haboyle and I work at Open Eye Gallery as Responsive Program Coordinator. I'm really excited to be joined by Ruth White today as part of the Hypertext Book Fair. So Ruth is an artist and researcher based in Liverpool whose work looks at the role of photography and the photo book in representing social class and the formation of identity. So Ruth completed a PhD at Manchester Metropolitan University in 2018, which was titled A Practice-Led Investigation into the Role of the Photo Book in Representing the British Working Classes since 1975. I'm really interested to speak to Ruth about her research and to explore ways in which we can understand and look critically at the photo book. Um, I was really interested, Ruth, in how you talk about the importance of photo books in giving visibility to human experiences, and especially those that might not be represented in mainstream media. Um, they can be important documents of specific periods in time, but also you explore some of the ways in which photography can be problematic in its representation of communities and some of the ethical considerations of that. So I'm going to hand over to Ruth now, um, who's going to give a 30 to 40 minute presentation and then we'll have some time at the end for questions. Hi, um, hi everyone. <laughs> um, thanks for coming to listen to the talk. Um, what I'll do is I'll share my screen so you can, we can, I can talk through the slides. So for this talk, I will discuss my PhD, a practice-led investigation into the role of the photo book in representing the British working classes since 1975. I will give a brief summary of what the research was about and then discuss the eight zines I produced for the practice element of the research. The aim of my research was to do two related things, to investigate how the photo book has represented the impact of Thatcherism on working class lives and to investigate how the photo book can be used to represent the lived experience of class through the production of photo zines about key areas of working class life. The decision to produce a collection of photo zines about key areas of working class life, work, leisure, family, and to a lesser extent, politics, was largely influenced by mem my memories of watching the US crime drama, The Wire. In The Wire, different institutions of the city of Baltimore are examined in each of the five seasons through the narrative of following the money. It begins with the illegal drugs trade and moves on to the seaport system, local government and bureaucracy, education and schools, and then finally the print news media. Each season adds more depth and understanding of how each of the institutions are connected and influence each other. In a similar way, I hope that when the zine that I produce for my PhD were looked at as a collection, then a broader picture of working class life at this particular historical moment would be built up. Obviously, it is only and could ever only be a snapshot as there are a wide range of working class experiences, and so it would be impossible to cover all of them. In terms of design, affordability and accessibility, the zines were influenced by Craig Atkinson's Cafe Royal books. I particularly like his use of full bleed photographs in many of the zines. There is something particularly satisfying about them and also his use of uncoated paper. I came to realise that full bleed photographs make you feel psychologically closer to the subject of the work as opposed to the psychologically distancing effect of white borders which mimic the idea of looking into a window. It is important for me for political personal and political reasons that the subjects of the work are given a copy of the work when I can afford it. The colour versions are much more expensive, so more expensive to give away. But the thing I love about photography is how it can be read and appreciated in so many ways and in so many different contexts. You don't need an art education to read, appreciate or have an emotional response to a photograph as photography is a universal language. My work involves me taking responsibility for every aspect of the production and distribution of the zines. 
projects usually come about through the relationships I have with one or more subjects of the photograph. Sorry, I'm just going to get it onto the slideshow. I was just going to say, yeah, do you want a full screen? Yeah, brilliant. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so an important part of my PhD research process involves a visual and textual analysis of seven British photo books that I chose because of the way they reveal different aspects of working class life during or as a consequence of the Thatcher period. I analyse the books in an order that reflects their subject matter, ranging from the most intimate and private to the most public. I began with Raise a Laugh and Nick Watlington's Living Room, which are both about the personal and domestic lives of working class families. I then moved on to Paul Graham's Beyond Caring, which is about the public experience of visiting unemployment offices, yet also reflects the personal through the expressions and body language of its subjects, who despite being surrounded by many people, appear isolated. Next, I analysed Martin Parr's The Last Resource and Paul Rees I Can Help, which both focus on consumerism and leisure and feature the most public areas of working class lives. Finally, I moved on to Chris Calypso's Pirelli work, which unlike the other photo books, represent the working classes as dignified producers rather than as hapless consumers. And then on to um, Chris Calypso's In Flagrante, which unlike Raise a Laugh points towards the causes of its subjects unemployment. And so now I'll give you a, a brief insight into the um, British photo books of lockdown, which also informed how I thought about the way I was producing my own photo zines. So as I've said, the collection of photo zines I produced for my PhD cover the main areas of working class life work, leisure, family, and to a lesser extent, formal politics. So I will now move quickly through each of the front and back covers of the zines I produce, which I have categorised in this slideshow into the key areas of working class life they represent. And then I will discuss each of the zines in more detail, working my way backwards from the most recent to the first one I produced. Front and back covers are important to the zines. The front covers are important for setting the tone and the back gives a sense of finality and the end of the book. And so that the, those two things are obviously something I, I thought very carefully about. Um, because for most of the zines, I didn't use text. Um, the titles were the only way I could communicate what the zines are about and how they should be read. I mean, obviously, a lot of the photos are self-explanatory, but the titles are a way of narrowing the possible readings down to more closely to like the, my intention for the zines. Right, so um, I'll just show you the front and back covers so, and the categories they fall into. So Phil Mannion, North End and Bakers, obviously about work. Um, the workers, which features writing um, that the, I asked the workers to do, that accompanied the, the photo zine. Then we've got Home Bake, which is also about another bakery, and that is about work. Then Leisure with Lavinia's Christmas party, a Christmas party in a, a sports centre. Also, Funland, a fictional weekend to Southport. Uh, Skeggy, um, slang for Skegness, a week's holiday in a caravan. Then, uh, two weeks in a static home in the south of France with me in laws for at the end of your stay, cleaning must be done. And then finally, um, he served his time at Camel Lid embodies the ideas in work, family and leisure. Um, oh, the, Camel, the reason I said finally was because Camel, he served his time as Camel Lids was the, the last scene I made, but um, I also made this one which touches on formal politics and it just so happened that particular 
political events were happening at the time, otherwise I'm not sure I would have ended up um, covering politics. Okay, so he served his time at Camel Laird as metonomically about many things. It is about the living standards of working class families who have lived through Thatcherism, the standard of living provided by working class jobs in general, and the demise of those types of apprenticeships and skilled jobs for working class men, which was accelerated by Thatcherism. The title is also a reference to the actual time served by my father-in-law as an apprenticeship, as a, an apprentice, as a fr French polisher at Camel Laird when he was 15. My father-in-law went on to spend more of his working life, working life at the Vauxhall motor plant in Ellesmere Port, but it was the apprenticeship at Leeds that provided him with a trade and craft skills he could be proud of that he was able to use again in his last job before retirement, working as a French polisher for a family-owned furniture restoration company. Through the way that I sequence photographs and camel lids, my main intention was to communicate an experiential sense of being in the space of my father-in-law's bedroom, and in turn, to communicate a sense of the lived experience of my father-in-law in that space. By doing this, I also wanted to build up a picture in the viewer's mind of the shabbiness of the room and hint at the type of person my father-in-law was. A man who was good with his hands and laboured for other people, including neighbours, his adult children, and as a French polisher working for a family business before he retired, visiting wealthy people living in big houses with fancy furniture, but at the same time neglecting his own home and living space. Um, an important thing to say about this is like um, it was only because I was so close to my in-laws that um, I asked my mother-in-law whether it was okay to take photographs in my father-in-law's bedroom about six months after he died. Um, the reason I really wanted to make the book was to sort of encapsulate all the things I'd thought over the years in the many conversations with him. Um, at loads of times when my husband went to the uh, football match, which they live by Tranmere's ground, um, I'd have loads of these conversations with my father-in-law and I'd ask him all like about his life and the jobs he'd done. And quite often I'd find out things me husband didn't even know about his dad and so yeah this book was about trying to sort of encapsulate all those ideas um, and I also it's important to say um, my father-in-law died of dementia and so the ethics of actually taken I didn't want to take photographs of him particularly um, as the dementia progressed, I felt like it was ethically wrong unless it, as he wasn't able to give permission. And so this photographing of objects and spaces um, seems like a relatively good ethically, ethical way of exploring some of the ideas I was thinking about. And so it's, um, I'll go through the images now. And so the front cover, um, it's like slightly out of focus shoes and this was like just by chance that one of the photographs I'd taken was out of slightly out of focus and so I thought it created a, a sense of like someone elderly the eyes getting not as strong so a start off I wanted to give a sense of like just the fact the bedroom hadn't been decorated for so long and um it's like different people had used the rooms, to stuck up posters. I think my husband or his brother had once stayed in the room. And so obviously the marks show how old the room is. I um, thought the pillows would give a, a sense of presence and absence. It's like ambiguous, you don't know. Uh, is the person who owns the bedroom still around? Um, so just more like just to show like quite general messiness around the room. Yeah, a view out of the window, what he would have seen when he looked out the back. An old television, I thought, give a sense of um, 
sort of like hoarding old technology and things not wanting to throw things out like an older generation who believe in fixing and mending things i thought this is one of my favorite images of thought um when you think about it you know the energy saving light bulb which gives off a dingy light the old sort of ugly colors of the um, lampshade and the sort of 1980s 1990s board around the room it's just a general sense of well it's not like a really comforting space to be in the farm foods bags i thought was good to symbolize and something about like um, the economic circumstances of my father-in-law. It's like what farm foods wasn't the only place they shopped, but um, it's just a good signifier. It's like if it was Marks and Spencer's bag, it might think you might think more about a different sort of person. I thought it's interesting how his wardrobe was like this um, sort of fake. Ele um, elegantly designed wardrobe when the fact is my father-in-law was a French polisher he he would have understood like good quality furniture but the furniture he worked on was for other people the boiler like they sharing a room with a noisy boiler which can be hot and keep you awake at night another sign of the discomfort the shoes at the side of the bed also give a sense of like presence as if the person might come back any minute. And then this, the mattress, although it's, it won't be clear to someone picking up the book unless they know the backstory about me father-in-law's dementia. But um, like yet yeah, in the final stages, me father-in-law was like incontinent and um, like because I, I was that close to them, like I would even help with the use to go and use the car for cleaner on the bedroom floor, you know, where you'd have accidents and things like that. But I think it's well, it's one of my favourite images because it's the the pattern and that it's quite an um I think quite a beautiful thing to look at, but at the same time you've got the ugliness of the stains. And then I thought it was good to, as you come into the end of the, the book, to like give more of a sense of finality with the, the empty bed and the pillows again. Um, obviously the tins of paint, it just shows like his bedroom was like almost like a dumping ground for all his tools. So somewhere to store your tools, which also, you know, says a lot about the sort of odd jobs he would do. And more bits and of tools and bits and bobs. And then I, I thought it was good to show like a door on the back page, like the closing of the door, the end of of the the book. So now I'll talk about Skeggy. Um, Skeggy is about a week-long family holiday in a caravan on a haven holiday park near Skegness. Through Skeggy, I attempted to communicate a sense of the lived experience of a typical caravan holiday. The photographs focus upon the public and the private and most intimate dimensions of the holiday. Visiting fairgrounds, arcades and the beach, eating in cafes, going to the holiday parks, disco in the evenings, and sleeping and relaxing in the caravan. Photographing my own family holiday offered a way of recording the intimate dimensions of working class holidays and life. My husband and daughter's immunity to me taking photographs was also beneficial for capturing them off guard and at their most natural. And this is a way of coming also closer to the lived experience of the holiday. Through the way that I sequenced photographs in Skeggy, my main intention was to communicate a sense of the lived experience of my family's holiday in a caravan and in turn, a sense of the lived experience of working class caravan holidays in general. 
like for all the photo scenes, I tried to create a sense of the experience of the passage of time and place. I used photographs of sleeping and meal times to give a sense of the rhythms of the day. I had week, a week's worth of photographs to choose from. And so considering how to create some sort of narrative was important when thinking about what photographs to put in and sort of having the cycles of, of the day was a, a way that I was able to create some structure in the book. Okay, so the front picture is just at the disco in the evening. It's like my own childhood memories, my neighbour who I was very close to. Um, she used to take me away with her daughter to their caravan in um, Rill. And I remember some brilliant memories of going to discos and winning bars of rock for dancing and things like that. And so I just wanted to try and capture that with the photo of my daughter dancing in the disco. Um, I thought this was a good first image, like first image in the book to have because it's sort of, it's a mimicking the, the act of taking photographs because the ride itself would take a photograph. And so, yeah, it was like, um, have a ride and a photo. It's just like the looking through the book is like the experience of going off the holiday, if that makes sense. So this was just in um, near the fair, just me daughters. Like going to cafes and getting cups of tea is like quite a like a nice part of those sort of British holidays or even uh, well any sort of holiday. So this was was quite a good image because me daughter looks quite bored, but then there's me husband in the background counting the money. And then you've got the shopping bags on the buggy. It's like when you're going around the fair, it's like, like getting change. And like, obviously you're thinking about how much it's all costing. Um, I wasn't able to really point to the economic aspects so much in this book, but it was something that I did want to try and highlight. But even like just the fact that even on holiday, you're always thinking about money. It's like when my mum tells me about us going to Butlins when I was little, she was just saying my dad was constantly at the um, ATM machine and the water was just flowing through the hands like um, water because like it tends to be quite expensive on some of these places. In some of these places, even though people quite often go because they haven't got a lot of money to go abroad on holiday. This one. What the first time I seen this photograph, I was crying with laughter because it's me husband. But um, obviously, it's not funny to people who don't know him. But it, I just like the contrast between him looking quite angry in the foreground, and then there's the sort of couple in the background, someone pushing a wheelchair, and that the, they just look oblivious. But um, I thought it was a good interruption to sort of the more calm photographs as well like this it, like just sudden picture of someone looking like they're being quite violent and also because my husband is very mild manners that's what for me why it made me laugh uh, this is obviously just another shot in the fairgrounds but <clears throat> um i liked the fact that i've got the iceland bag just this you know another signifier of like where you go and get your shopping because it's cheap the beach is obviously the place where so many people go on these type of holidays. I thought this was good to show just like a mundane aspect of holidays and looking, looking after a child. You've got to fold up the buggy and, and getting in and out the car and all that stuff. And this was something it's good to point out, like you can see some creep in the middle of that um, Zine and what I found when trying to get zines published by a range of different people, most places they always um, there's always some creep towards the the back, and it was only one place that I ended up finding where that wasn't a problem. But I also realised that 
um, there's a limit you need, like to the zines, you can only use 40 pages because otherwise you get lots of creep with the image showing through from the front. Like this is another um, image of something quite um, mundane. It's like opening the caravan door, but like that is something like tactile as particular to a caravan, you know, the going in and out, pushing the big handle down when you go in and out your caravan. And this is sleep, obviously, the rhythms of the day and then culminating going to bed of an evening. And then getting up in the morning and relaxing. As that this must have been like quite an old fashioned caravan. I think the uh, the curtains and the design of the um, sofa look quite dated. But it, we always find caravans really cozy, so that's why we love them. Just another day out. I like this because um, showing eating sam like where you make your sandwiches and wrap them in tin foil to save money. So this was like at the beach, but like obviously father and daughter looking very happy. Even though it features me, um, husband and daughter, it's not important for me, for the viewer to know it's they're related to me because I, I sort of want them to stand more generally for a particular experience. Getting, yeah, obviously ice creams are the big feature of being, when it's the summer for children love going to get an ice cream. And I thought this one was good for like showing the, um, like being a parent can be exhausting. That's one of the realities that before you become a parent, you don't really hear people talking about, but when they're a bit younger, you, you know, it can be tiring. And then I thought this was a good one to come towards the end of the book. It's quite a still image of looking out at some ducks. And then, you know, a shot from the, in the caravan, it's me husband's foot, just like the sense of relaxation. Um, right, so at the end of the, your stay, cleaning must be done. Is about a two week family holiday in a static caravan in a holiday park in the south of France. The intention of this zine is to create a sense of the experience of being on the holiday and through the title, a sense of the economic aspect of the holiday, which played a dominant role. The title is an extract from a document that was emailed to me by the owner of the static home before the holiday. On the last day, my husband and I spent the entire morning cleaning the static home before it was inspected by someone that the owner had employed in the same way that a landlord would inspect a property that was being vacated. Had it not been cleaned to a high enough standard, then we would have lost our large deposit. So using this extract as the title was a way of attempting to communicate to the viewer a sense of the economic aspect of the holiday that underpinned nearly every decision made and our daily experiences. So this is obviously an important feature of working class lives where even on holiday, if you're lucky enough to afford to go on one, many people can, as no, like not many people can afford to go on an annual holiday these days. You cannot escape worrying about money. Even choosing that, even though we were going abroad, I picked the chose to go to this this place with a privately owned static home because it was much cheaper than um, going through staying in a um, a hotel or you know doing the holiday a different way and it meant that we could invite me in laws and it wouldn't cost any more money just needed to get the flights. So in this scene I also used like the like the rhythms of everyday life as a way of organizing and creating a, a sense of narrative in the book. So I thought the front image is quite good because it looks, even though the um, on a beach the digging, if you look behind, there's like someone sunbathing, but they look like they're working. It's just a reminder of, of work, even when you're at, you know, it's at leisure. 
I thought this was also a good way to start the book, like coming out the water when you've got salt, like water in your eyes and the salt. And um, yeah. So this is just giving a sense of being at the beach. I thought this this is sort of like like a just a standard holiday photo where everyone just gets says cheese and gets their picture taken. That was like at a cafe with me in laws. Um this this was my father in law. Um it it was only year later on that my mother in law said she noticed his dementia was starting to get worse on the holiday. It's like even on the way to the airport, I noticed he had a cut on the back of his neck where he must have shaved it and really cut himself or it could just you know there was just like little signs like that um but yeah he kept napping quite a lot and um, so obviously i captured this and um, the balloon on the floor is from me mother-in-law's 70th birthday that she had while we were there but i mean the viewer might not know that Um, I thought this was a good way of echoing the image before. The, so I was thinking about the formal qualities of the images, how they fit together as well. This is the morning of my um, mother-in-law's 70th and I thought it was quite um, a touching image because it's just like the, the young child who's just got up with her grandmother and so this is like the crowd quite crowded where um where there's tensions between me mother-in-law who's used to doing the cooking and then the my husband like ending up doing cooking and they're feeling a bit like a spare part so there was like yeah there was tensions on the holiday that you can't see in the zine even though we all got along, we in general got along very well. It's a, like, obviously it's different when you're on holiday with people and you're just together 24 seven. Yeah, this, I thought this was one of the most exotic looking photos of the pool. Well, I actually, uh, I realized that I started experimenting with different cameras to think how you know how to capture more spontaneous images and so I tried a range of different compact cameras um, and I found this um, Canon photo I think it was a um, waterproof camera that I think a famous photographer had used and I, I got it quite cheap but I was able even though you can't just put it deep dip it right in the water, it was just more safe to use that round than the pool, so I could get in the water holding it as well. This is like meal times. It's like if my husband's like eating uh, mussels, which you'd say is quite fancy, but then you've got this sort of um, tacky sort of print on the, the um, seating area. And then this image, I think it sort of communicates a sense of like a lack of space and crowdedness. And you can see the potty there and just all the like all the stuff that goes with having a child with you on holiday. And there, that's like the re, that's like recurring motif as me father-in-law at like snoozing and at the beach again. Obviously, like a common experience which most people can relate to making sand castles. So I hope I've someone like I've heard pe someone people who've looked at it saying it, you know, it does remind them of their childhood, so it's quite nostalgic. And then this was I think this is the final image you see before the back page, and it's just when you're on like holiday somewhere really nice and on your last day you'd have like a big look around like you're drinking in the scenery to think oh this is the last time i'm gonna see this and then yeah finally another image of my father-in-law asleep right. 
So this one, Funland, is an attempt to capture a sense of working class leisure and holidays. It is about a weekend in Southport. Southport is a town and a seaside resort to the north of Liverpool, which like New Brighton, the subject of Martin Parr's The Last Resort, is very popular with day trippers from Liverpool. Because of this, it is a place which is likely to arouse feelings of nostalgia for many working class people from Liverpool, who like myself were taken there as children. Funland has an element of fiction because it is because it is made up of photographs taken during a week away in land unknown in Wales, a day out to Snowsley Safari Park, and a weekend in Southport. The photos were taken over a period of two years. And so it was because they were in black and white, I was able to blend them together with, you know, I wouldn't imagine many viewers would realise if they're not all taken in one place. So through the way that I sequence photographs in Funland, my main intention was to communicate a sense of the experience of being on holiday and through this a general sense of the lived experience of working class day trips and holidays at seaside resorts. Like the photograph sequences in Skeggy, I communicate a sense of the experience of the passage of time, which is an important part of the lived experience, by showing different parts of the day culminating in bedtime, signified by the photograph of the blonde-haired girl lying in bed. I also show aspects of daily routines, such as eating, which we all tend to do at roughly the same times of the day. So when we see, when people are seen eating in photographs, Without thinking, we automatically presume it must be a time of the day when meals are eaten. And for this, the front cover, I didn't, um, I just, because Funland was such, on the side of the building was so big, I thought that that could work as the title rather than me adding the text Funland. So yeah, um, I like the way my daughter's looking at me, but it creates a sense of the viewer feeling like they're being looked at and um, instead of a more active subject in the work rather than passively being photographs being taken of as if they're unaware. So obviously going into arcades and um, the grabbing machines is something like lots of people do. I like this one for the way the cloud mimics sort of the style of me daughter's hair and it's quite, it makes me think of the 1950s. Uh, although the dolls are quite uh, old fashioned too, it's in a shop window, I thought I would include that photograph because it's creating a sense of what a child might notice when they're out. just walking along the pier like getting a cone of chips while you're out is that's another nice part of the day and then I like this photograph because I thought it shows like the emotional labor of parenting like the kids not wanting to get back in the buggy and like um, and he's trying to put the dummy in her mouth um, And then this, the evening time, staying in the hotel. And looking out the window in the hotel. Well, it was a premiere in, there's a, a premiere in in Southport that we've stayed at a few times. This was actually taken in Nosley Safari Park where they've got a fairground and you can sort of see the fair in the background. This is in Southport on the, the um, play area. I like how it's, the photographs as well show like father-daughter interactions. That was also in um, Nosley Safari Park. And then in another cafe. And I, I do like the sequence of photographs of like showing being in the playground, which obviously all children love. And then finally, I finish with a shot of like the journey, journey home, and um, quite often young children fall asleep. And if you look in the reflection, you can see me taking the photograph. 
so you finally see who the, the person is who's been taking the photos. The Vineyard's Christmas Party is about a children's Christmas party held in a sports centre in Walton Park, in Walton in the north of Liverpool, where I grew up. The party was arranged and hosted by Lavinia, a working class woman and her husband for their friends and neighbours. One of her neighbours is the mother of a close friend of mine who invited my daughter to the party. I then asked my friend if she could ask Lavinia if I could take photographs of the party and she obviously agreed. I also asked for her to get the parents of the children of the party to sign permission slips before the day of the party to make sure they were all happy with me taking photographs. Lavinia charged the families a small fee for the party which did not cover all of its co costs or the gifts they gave to the children. When I said to Lavinia how kind I thought she was for going to so much trouble and for evidently having spent so much money, she replied, you only live once. This sense of community and neighbourliness is something that used to be quite common amongst working class people. And indeed, I spent more time with my neighbour Sue when I was a child than with my own parents. So Sue was my mum's neighbour who I grew up with and who used to take me away on caravan holidays. But she um, appears in a few of the books and she was also behind how obviously I got access to take photographs in this party, but I also got to take photographs where she works. And so my sort of network of working class family and friends, because that's what like my background also played a big role in how I was able to get access to some of these um, places where which might be a bit more difficult. So the front cover of this um, is like entering Santa's grotto, which I like, even though it's very grainy, it's just like that sense of expectation and people peering in of what going to visit Father Christmas. Um, the back page, I like how that links because on the back is a little boy coming out and so it sort of echoes the front page. But it also, with the boy coming out at the end, it's also a sense of, oh, that's the, the end of the party. So here's inside, they were wrapping up. It's, it's quite a comical picture. The woman dressed as an um, elf. So I, I was like sat inside the grotto, um, taking photographs of the children, came in to visit Father Christmas. And obviously that's not something you will get to photograph very often. And uh, um, this also captures a sense of when, you know, that parenting thing where, oh, smile for the camera and get you, you know, parents want to take photos of these sorts of special times in their children's lives. So this was, um, they weren't standing together, I just chose to put the two photographs together because obviously they echo each other and it was thought they were nice portraits. Um, it was surprising how well the children did. Basically while I was at the party I was just constantly moving around. Um, I did a, took the photos from a kneeling position to create a sense of a child's perspective. And the children weren't really asked to pose. I didn't tell them to stand in a particular way. They just like naturally stood in a way, which is, I think was really, turned out well. So this is like obviously a common party experience going to the buffet. That's the, this is my daughter again, obviously eat, eating a plate of party food lying on the floor. I really like this one because, it, you know, that's Sue, me, me mum's friend, but um, her and her mum really love children, but just like that, the com sense of community where you're interested in each other's children and things like that. I thought the composition was good as well and the way the, the little girl's looking quite sulkily at the camera. Um, in this picture is the, the woman on the left is Dolly, who's Sue's mother. And I, I spent a lot of time with her growing up. Um, she was, I went, it was her, her and her husband's caravan we used to stay in. 
So um, a lot of this party had a lot of autobiographical connections and memories for me because the sports centre was where, as a child, I would go over because Dolly lives by the sports centre and go to the roller discos and things like that. Thought this was a good one, the way that they stood and looked at me and then you've got the girl in the background who looks a bit gawky, sort of peering around. The, at the party there was, they had everything like ca uh, candy floss and hot dogs, they really went to town with like thinking of things with the kids. There was a big curtain in the middle where they, they used that in the sports centre to like separate for like when people are playing things like badminton and stuff. This, I thought this, I, I like this picture because it captures like the way Dolly's looking at this baby. She's not related to the child, but you know, you can see how much she's really happy, like how much she loves children. And there's a daughter, Sue, holding the same child. And then this, I thought this was a good image to come to the end on because they've got the coats on. You can see it's like the party's coming to an end. And then finally, I thought it was good the way you could just see the woman's hand sticking out the top of the curtain as the, the little boy comes out. And then, you, you know, that's the leaving the party. That sense of, like I mentioned before, with the front cover sort of echoing the open curtain. Sorry, I don't seem to have my notes for home baked for some reason. But um, this was also another bakery. But the reason, the reason I chose another bakery was because this was one of me, I think the third zine I made, and so I knew because an artist had worked with the the bakery. The bakery used to be owned by a couple of sisters, and um, the Mitchells. So the bakery used to be called the Mitchells. But because of things um, that were happening in the area, they ended up having to sell the bakery. And for the biennial, um, some artists took over the bakery and reopened it. And now it is still, the bakery is still running and it's called Home Baked. And so I thought with an artist being involved, I would most likely to be able to get permission to take photographs there. And I was right, it was relatively easy. And as anyone who takes documentary photographs must know, like one of the hardest aspects is gaining access to people and places. So this first image I start with, this is a way I sort of hint at the economics and some of the background of the area. It's like a brighter Anfield is coming with like an idealised working class family on the front. Um, and so the, the it's like signifies the neighbourhood, you know, it's being sort of in, there's a lot of change going on. And then you see some of the names of the people involved, like the council, but also private investors. So uh, then we move into the bakery. Before I went there, I did have an afternoon where I volunteered because they work with like volunteers and it was a way of me being able to get to know the staff a little bit so I wasn't going in completely cold because um, I went into photograph on a football match day. I wanted to create a sense of the bakery on a typical match day. So these were just some shots. There's the pies being baked. They have a serving hatch at the side where they serve food during the match. Um, so I thought that was a good image to show that. Um, someone, this is before the big, the b busiest period where everyone starts pouring in. And then now you're getting a sense of the, um, the football fans. I thought it was quite comical, the um, middle-aged couple peering in 
Like sort of squinting through the window. Even though it's not the clearest or best photograph, I thought it was good. You know, the man rubbing his hands give a sense of like the chilliness. You know, got, my husband goes to uh, as a season ticket, and I just think I couldn't stand the cold and sitting out in the cold for that long. I thought it was quite comical the way they're both doing the same thing with the hands on the face of the side and what they want to buy. And this is just a shot outside and then save them from the hatch. And then I've got a series of, uh, I just stood with the camera in one spot, I've got a series of different images through the hatch. I thought it was a good like framing device. And then finally, um, I thought this was a good still, like a sense of a still image to, to finish on, like the end of when it's gone quiet. So I thought um, it wa wasn't only the bakery that interested me, it was the fact that it was to do with like football fans and work, like football is sort of quite a big thing in working class culture, like how people's lives are arranged around it. like. Just speaking from personal experience, when I was a child, we like I grew up near Everton's football ground, and so I could always hear the, you know, if a goal was scored, and and my dad would go to the matches, but then my husband and his brother and brother-in-law, we've got season tickets, and we go over to um, Prenton, so the supports Tranmere, and I'll sit with his mum. And I used to sit with his dad and be like talking with them while they're at the match and then they come back and then you have a Sunday dinner. So it's like, obviously with the virus and everything, that's like had an impact on people being able to do things like that. Right, so the final picture it was just like part of a double spread, like half on the front, half on the back. So this is the second, the second book I made. Um, so you get a sense of the earlier books, um, more of a whiteboard around because it was only when I was making Lavinia's Christmas party that I realised, you know, about the the white border and how it creates a bit of a distance and effect. And then from then on, I, I always tried to use full bleed for all the photographs. Uh, if they don't want to get behind him, well, they know where that they can go. It's about a rally held in Liverpool's li Liverpool Liner Hotel to support the Labour Party leader, Jeremy Corbyn, in 2016, following the failed coup of a group of li Labour MPs from the right wing of the party. Following the coup, many Labour Party members, including myself, joined Momentum a left-wing campaigning organisation which was set up by Tony Benn's former campaign manager, John Landsman, following Corbyn's leadership election. It was through being part of the group that I found out about the rally and gained permission to take photographs. The title, If They Don't Want to Get Behind Them While well, They Know Where They Can Go, comes from a speech made by a working class woman made at the rally. It was chosen as the title as it captures a sense of what motive pe mo motivated people to attend, most of whom were Labour Party members and how they felt. This, the sequencing of the photographs and the title are about trying to give a sense of what it felt like to be at the rally. The use of black and white pho photography gives a sense of the past and an older style trade union politics in contrast with the polished PR style politics of today. So as it was the only, the second time I'd taken documentary photographs and I didn't have a flasher for my camera, I used very high ISO um, 1600. So the photographs are very grainy. And I was also nervous because of my lack of experience and being in a room of hundreds of people where they could see me taking photographs. Um, when putting together the zine, because of my lack of, lack of experience. I tried to include as many photographs as possible. So this affected the design and it ended up with, you'll see here, um, 
like a letterbox effect. So, so just so I could get as many landscape photos into as many of the spreads as possible. Um, I just so um, so the, the fact I started off the page, I created like a background to the writing, which was a bit like noise in photography because I wanted it, you know, to sort of blend in with the design of the re the rest. And so the speech was like from the woman who she, um, and was able to transcribe the speech from YouTube because someone had recorded it. So that was how I could be very precise about what she said. And so I think when the uh, viewer reads this, it just creates a, like a sort of context for the photographs. Um, I didn't use it in any of, in other zines because it just never felt appropriate. It just um, was something I did for this. And so this is the beginning of the rally where people are waiting. You can just see them all sitting around. Then there was um, some the socialist singers at the beginning on the left. And then you've got, I wanted to create a sense of the audience and um, the speakers as well. So you've got the speakers and then you see the back of the audience watching. Then there was a singer at the, um, and then people living, listening to watching a video and then there was like the host of bald headed men man who looks quite stern who was like yeah introducing all of the people and then you've got the, the couple of old men again sitting watching um i realized that if i made some of the pictures larger it gives them a greater sense of importance and especially if i thought one of the some of the photographs i liked better I wanted to emphasize them so this was like and um, there was quite a few women who made speeches for um so or like by making the there isn't that many images of women making speeches in the book but it was only because some of them didn't turn out very good and so yeah this was a way of giving it more prominence by making it a larger image and more shots of the audience and then um, I thought this was good, the pointing thing. Um, in my thesis, I write about how um, politicians nowadays, they do this impotent thumb gesture where they sort of tuck the thumb under the, under the hands. It's hard to explain unless you see it, but it's almost like it looks unnatural, but I think they do it because they don't want to look aggressive because like pointing and things like that is like considered to look like aggressive or authoritarian. But the thing about the people who spoke in the rally, it's like they're speaking um, with passion rather than thinking, oh, what looks good, you know, on in an interview. Thought that this was a good image caption, you know, <laughs> really the, the man, the expression on his face as he's clapping as if like, go on there. Yeah, I really agree with that. And someone else speaking quite passionately. The man in the background laughing, I got to know him. He's visually impaired, so it looks a bit strange the way he's um, got his eyes closed and laughing. But I mean, something must have been said that amused him, but yeah. <laughs> and then uh, this was like one of the main organizers speaking with his clipboard. And another point and shot. Yeah, and then obviously you can see the last image, it was a wraparound um, photograph. But you can sort of tell, I think, looking at this earlier zine, that had sort of, um, you know, how, how things had changed from the final one I did. Okay, this is the last one, which was the first one I made. When I made this, I'd never taken any documentary photographs before. I hadn't... Um, I was, wasn't used to the camera I'd used. I got like some Pentax K1000, I think it's called, because I read that that was like a thing that student photographers used. And um, because I didn't have any training in photography and couldn't access it, even though I would have loved to, 
I was sort of having to teach myself as I went along. Um, and that's not to say, because you think maybe professional photographers might get annoyed thinking, oh, you know, as if, oh, like anyone just thinking they can go along taking <laughs> documentary photographs. Um, but it's not that, I suppose it's just as an artist. I, I, I've worked with different materials, I've used a lot of different things to communicate ideas and so yeah you just sort of pick up how to use different materials and different ways of working as you go along and it's that like because it's something you really want to communicate you sort of it makes you really concentrate on like the skills you need to to learn and so yeah this and the reason I was using black and white photography was because, uh, to begin with, was because um, you could get it in 800 ISO, whereas I didn't realise in um, you could also get ISO 800 and um, for colour. So yeah, I was tending to use black and white because I could push the film to make it like set it. At, you can use an 800 ISO but set it for. 1600 and um, they call it pushing the film so you can take like yeah photos in lower darker conditions without a um, flash okay Bill Mannion North End Bakers is about an old bakery in Walton a socially deprived area in the north of Liverpool where I grew up it's accompanied by Phil Mannion's North End Bakers the workers a colour zine of scans of statements handwritten in Biro by employees of Phil Mannion about their lives inside and outside the bakery. It was the first scene I produced and was the, and because it was the first time I'd ever taken documentary photog photographs, I felt very nervous as I didn't know what to expect. I also hadn't been inside to the bakery before, so I had no idea what the lighting conditions would be like. So that's why I chose to use like an ISO of 1600. I mean, I might've got away with lower, but it's, I just didn't know what to expect. And in my, my mind, I was expecting a really dark place. Um, but I, I, in the shop, it was very bright. And so I did end up with a few, quite a few overexposed images. But obviously that, that was all part of the learning process. Like Fun Man, the photographs in Phil Mannion North End Bakers were taken in more than one location, but were edited together and presented as if they were taken in one place. At the time of photographing, there were two Phil Mannion shops, both located in Walton, not far from each other, which were photographed on the same day to document the business in its entirety. So the main aim of Phil Mannion North End Bakery is to create a sense of the day-to-day -day experience of working there and the selection of photographs from both shops was about using the best images out of a limited number to achieve that and to create a narrative that makes sense to the reader. So the photos move from the outer shop uh, into the inner areas where cakes are decorated and equipment is washed and then finally into the inner area where bread is baked. Politically, it has the potential to empower its workers by allowing them to see themselves and their work colleagues more objectively, not only as historical subjects, but also as cogs in the machinery of the business. Their zine of writing also gives each of the workers more of an insight into the experiences of their work colleagues inside and outside of the workplace. So this was a bit like um, an establishing shot. Obviously, um, zines have a relationship and the work sequences of photographs have a relationship to um, the fil film industry and editing um, the way things are edited together. So like, obviously, like, so if you watch Friends, there's the establish establishing shot outside um, I don't know whether it's apartments they live in, but it just gives a context of where everything else is, where the um, acting is happening, if that makes sense. So I thought a close up, it's quite an old fashioned, like these old fashioned cakes and the texture of the um, metal trays they sit on. 
um, one of the women who worked there slicing some ham thought well, this was quite a good image. This one's a bit, I can say it's a bit too grainy, but it's that's Sue, um, me, me mum's neighbour. She works in the front in the shop. This, I thought this was good showing like saving it serving a customer i had to like stand be at the back of the shop just trying to get photographs and um, obviously you always have that fear if you're taking photographs without asking permission first in case you upset anyone but sometimes in an ideal world well you would ask permission but once you do then people tend to not act naturally so it's that like getting that balance right so this is like the inside when the shop's like really busy, both the women working. I thought the inclusion of the clock in like one of the places on the like sort of cheap fake wood panel wall with like price, handwritten price lists, was the clock was the idea of time watching because anyone who's done like a really boring job, you know, you're just constantly watching the clock thinking about wanting to like when's it going to be home time i had like quite um before before i actually um did my phd in the ma and all that i had many years after my fine art degree of working in like jobs like working in pubs and things like that and so i sort of used my experience of that is like what i brought to when i was taking the photographs thinking about well what things should I put in? So that even in Phil Mannion, even though it's a, you might think these photographs were taken 20 or 30 years ago because it's so old fashioned, like even the machine Sue's using there to um, slice the bread. With me, um, background in fine art, I used to, I trained in drawing, painting and printmaking. And so, um, like technically you might think oh that that's awful what a grainy photograph but a sort of like in a way it reminds me of some of the in, like sort of impressionism and pointillism i liked how this image even though it's far like it in an ideal world it wouldn't be that grainy but the way you can see right through to the different levels and how sue is in the front from facing the customers while the men are in in the back they can sort of behave how they want and have a laugh and a joke but like when you work on the front counter and facing the customers you've always got to um you know be careful about your behavior because you're sort of performing performing a role so in a way the men who make the food in the back have got like more freedom so this was um, a Polish man, um, sorry, I've forgotten his name, Marius, I think it was. I didn't get to speak to him on the day, but he did like sort of the, un sort of what might be classed as the unskilled work of like packaging things and just helping out other people, um, which is, but I hoped when it came to, when I asked them all to write something about their life lives, I hoped this would be, interesting and it was one of the most interesting things because it talked about his life and his interests outside of work like he was really into um weightlifting and cycling and things but he was like quite passionate in the things that he wrote but which that gives an insight that the photographs can't give i thought this was a nice image even though it's just like an object but like i think the the metal turns out you know well in the in black and white that must have been like a mix mixing the cake mixture and then decorating the um the clairs. and then this is in the heart of the bakery he's like it's a massive machine for like mixing up all of the dough and this was uh, mick the one of the main bakers so this is finish off with a sequence of images of Mick baking the bread. This is one of my favourite images. I thought it it turned out turned out well. Um, I 
and this gives a sense of like a wider perspective of like what it looks like in, like in the bakery with all the, the bread trays and things like that and then this was the final image I liked and um, the way Sue was looking away from the camera it adds like a bit of mystery I've seen some like photo other um, photographers have done some image images where I've seen like someone looking away and um, I really like that so yeah I thought it was a good idea okay that, that's the end of the slideshow I can stop sharing it now thanks thanks very much for that um it was really nice to hear kind of your thought process when approaching each scene and some of the kind of your broader concerns and the themes you were looking at um, I thought it was really interesting how you kind of use your kind of personal experiences in life um, as a subject matter but to speak about um, experiences that are a lot more like universal mm -hmm. and to give context to kind of um, both like social and political kind of issues as well without overtly kind of trying to do that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I do have a few questions for you. Um, and I just kind of wondered to begin with, um, if you could talk a bit about kind of what led you to this area of research um, and your own kind of experiences um, that kind of made you want to focus on um, working class identity. Well, when, um, to begin with, I wasn't, that wasn't going to be, when I started my PhD, I was going to um, write just about um, the representation of the working classes in art in general. But um, I then went to interview Richard Billingham, who made Raise a Laugh. Um, and it was after seeing his work, and I kept looking at other people's work that I just more and more thought, I've got like, I've got two MAs. One is in right, like, research but one is in practice and so I just increasingly felt like I've done all this training making art it's such a shame I'm not gonna you know make something um and so I think because the um raise a laugh was like was a I don't know it was the most interesting thing to me um I think that's why I just kept thinking oh well I'll make you know, I'll have a go at make, taking photographs and making zines. And then obviously after I went and like talked to Richard Billingham and seeing his work and everything and talk to him, it's like I came back and I, I had to ask per permission and to go through all this process of like swapping to say, well, I actually want to do 50% of my PhD practice in making zines. And also it was, I had to convince me tutors that it was a good idea because when you're doing a PhD, the um, tutors always want to keep you quite narrowly focused. They don't want you to sort of go off the rails because they, you know, they're there to make sure you um, succeed. And so obviously they get nervous if it's something they didn't know what to expect or whether I would be able to do it. So, um, but the main thing was, um, if it was going to be through the writing or producing something, was um, the main issue I wanted to be able to communicate something about the lived experience of class. And so it's like either writing about art or making it was like a vehicle as a way of doing that. Um, so I've got this little note here I wrote for myself. Um, it's just... Bit, the big thing I kept talking about is the, the psychic lang landscape of class, which is um, something from a late a sociologist called Diane Ray. And uh, the psychic landscape of class is class thinking and feeling. And then there's this um, Richard Sennett and Jonathan Cobb wrote a book called The Hidden Injuries of Class. And I thought just the phrase, the hidden injuries of class, I thought was such a powerful idea and um so i don't think i'd do it through the zines but i sort of draw out different things 
in my um, thesis. So I want, it's sort of, I wanted to be able to talk about that no matter what way I did it. Um, yeah. That makes it. And also it's a big thing is me, my own upbringing, even when I was making work on the MA, different projects, I did um, a work about a disused hospital. It kept always coming back to sort of autobiographical themes, but not overt where it's just like too personal that it's not universal. It's more about using autobiographical to try and bring out more universal ideas. And then, once I've made things and then I, I write about them that I'm able to draw it out even more. Um, yeah, I suppose you kind of talk a bit about how um, the effect of books like Raise a Laugh kind of had on you um, and inspired you. And you kind of describe how your analysis of existing photo books um, informed how you developed your own scene making and kind of provided um, both like ways of working and representation. Um, and you, you talk about how you um, work with those and also against those. Yeah. Um, um, if you could like talk a wee bit more about aspects that influenced how you approached your own photographic work and kind of what aspects inspired you and what aspects of those did you want to challenge in your work? Yeah, I, I thought it was like I picked Raise a Laugh. Um, I also picked Nick Wapplington's Living Room because I thought both of them, um, it was good because Raise a Laugh is more focused on a sort of like more extreme deprivation. Obviously, um, Ray is, for anyone who hasn't, looked at the book um the artist father who's an alcoholic and they live with like in a crowded flat with loads of animals and his mum's overweight with tattoos and so some people might say oh you know it's criticize it it's sensational um martha rosler wrote about it in i've forgotten the name of it. it's quite a famous book she wrote um but i i actually sort of have a discussion about that in my thesis, you know, saying about, um, she's very critical of him, like saying it's like a freak show and all this, cause it, his work appeared in Sensation with um, the young British artists work, which were all, was all sensational. Um, but in a way it's a truthful, he, he didn't set out to do that and, it's a truthful representation of his family. He, it wasn't about him trying to take advantage of them. There was no way he could take the photographs of his family in their life without it being sensational. But it wasn't like, deli like deliberate, like when you watch some of the poverty porn programs that are always on the telly. Um, so, but there was things like he did where like close-ups of like stains on the wall or a, like a filthy floor with the dog licking the floor and things like and um and so things like focusing on stuff like that I, um in my thesis I write about objection like you know the like like sort of feeling repulsed as like political and so if you represent working class people in that sort of a way that's a political thing but um and so obviously I wouldn't want any of my work to be sensational, but it's not um, it's not that I'm critical of his work for being sensational. But I thought that it was good to contrast it with Nick Wapplington's living room because in living room, um, it's more of a upbeat um, photo book. You can tell the family's poor, but it's not as like, it's just a more, like I say, it's a more middle of the road poverty that I feel, felt like was closer to my own experience. And looking at both the books, it made me realize, well, you don't always have to show the extremes. There is like a temptation to want to always show the extreme. And it's like most working class people don't fall into the extreme 
le- you know, extreme levels. Lots of people have jobs and ordinary lives and um, they're not necessarily alcoholics or, you know, living in squalor. And so I thought what I learned from analysing those book is, books is thinking, well, you know, you can show, it's just as important to show people just getting by and just average working class lives. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, and just to give a broader view in general, I guess, um, of if you talk about working classes, like there's not just one experience, but like multiple experiences. Um, yeah, I was, I suppose one of the things um, that I briefly mentioned previously as well is kind of how um, your work is personal um, and documents like your lived experience people you know lived experience um but you also kind of have like a sense of remove from the subject matter so even when you're photographing like your daughter and your husband um they become more, like a more universal figure um yeah and you're kind of consciously framing a narrative um particularly through like your use of titles and uh, your focus on particular themes, those kind of overarching themes of your work. Um, Yeah, I think like the saying, the personal is political feels very apt when you're kind of looking at the work. Um, But I wondered kind of how much did your own kind of experiences and life play into the narratives you created? Um, But how did you kind of step outside the personal um, to kind of look at your own life um, as like an observer rather than it being so deeply kind of personal. I don't really know if my question makes sense, but mm-hmm. how did you kind of like remove, remove yourself enough to yeah. like speak about these wider themes, I guess? I think it was sort of because I knew um what I wanted to achieve so when I was if I went when I went on the caravan holiday I thought I just was thinking in a more sort of removed way thinking oh this would be a great way of showing the general experience of a caravan holiday so when I was thinking about when do I take a photograph what do I take a photograph of it was like thinking of things that sort of show typical but connected to obviously my memories as a child going to caravans but just thinking well what is what are the typical things people tend to do on these these type of holidays and so I suppose it was always having that in the back of my mind and also as in developing the practice like making the zines as I got more um familiar with the process like starting to think about well what what looks good on a double double page rather than thinking in terms of oh will this be a really good single image just sort of going with like an idea of like a certain what would make a good front cover what would make a good back cover type thing that obviously you don't make you don't like um it's not that cold and calculating, but it's part of the process that's going on. But then you're also capturing, responding to what's happening in front of you. But I suppose, um, yeah, I suppose as a, automatically when you're behind a, a camera, you're sort of removed from the situation because you're, you can't get involved. You're like an out, you sort of make yourself an outsider. Like when I went to the party to take photographs, I couldn't sit with my daughter and be one of the parents at the party. And it's sort of, yeah, you just the role of the photographer, you become naturally more, you know, objective and outside. And you obviously looking through the lens, you're framing the world constantly and thinking, does this look, will this make a good photograph? Um, and you sort of learn because of the cost of film as well. You take le- less photos, but so you, it's more about carefully considering, well, is that worth taking a photograph of? And so there might be things you do miss out on because you're thinking like that. But, um, but I think it was important for me to it not to feel like 
oh, this is some indulgent thing. This just make books about their family. So, but I think raise a laugh. It doesn't come across like it's a personal. Do you know, you wouldn't necessarily know the person take the photographs was a member of a family, even though intellectually you'd think, well, you'd have to be, you know, know that family well enough to have captured those images. Like Nick Wapplington was just a friend of the family. Well, he must have been quite close and used to go to their, their house every Saturday. Um, but yeah, you, um, the sort of you've got to be close enough to the subjects to be able to capture those type of images but then obviously be removed enough that they're not like just too personal and don't communicate the ideas you want them to yeah i think um yeah and, and particularly the series kind of around your family you can tell you're kind of like embedded in the scene but you're not kind of visibly present as well. But also just like that, there was a sense that every scene that you're kind of photographing, you are nearly part of just because people's reactions are so natural. Um, yeah. Not, they don't feel kind of like someone's pointing a camera at them. There's never like a sense of discomfort. It all kind of feels very natural. Yeah. But yeah, I was wondering kind of, um, if you could speak a wee bit about the distribution of your zines, um, you talk about it being like a key value of your practice, um, your practice, and I wondered kind of like were the zines made for the people you photographed um, rather than being for an outside audience? I know that they were in the context of a PhD, mm -hmm. um, but kind of why was it important to you? Um, um, and kind of also, did you get any feedback from the people you photographed? Yeah. Um, I think um, one of the things that I liked about Cafe Royal books was um, was the fact that they were they were cheap, so um, people could afford, you know, they're affordable. But I'm realistic to know that even if things are affordable, doesn't mean people necessarily would be at the places, go to a gallery shop and buy them or, you know, have access or have an interest in them. And um, so there's that sense of realism that I might think, well, I want the um, the people I'm giving these books to, to feel a particular way about them. But they might, like when I gave the um, people at Sue's Bakery all the coffee, they could have all just because of the nature of them being a booklet because they just they wouldn't have known how much they cost to print they could have just chucked them in recycling or you know put them somewhere and never looked at them again but you would hope that they would um for me it's like the political and personal dimension is wanting the people in the photographs to feel a sense of pride it's like um yeah to think oh you know to see like their everyday lives, which like they're not celebrities, like someone's taking an interest in them. And I think it's nice for them to be able to show their children and they go oh, this, because it's a very, un like most people never see each other in the workplace. It's, you know, when you think about what gets, what people, what things are photographed and what not, like, for example, hardly anyone would take a photograph at a funeral. But it's like these the idea of not many people would have photographs of themselves at work. Um, so that, that appealed to me. But um, I realised that even if you want a gallery audience, that the reality is hardly anyone will ever see your work. Um, it's like when I was younger and I used to think, I want to be a famous artist. Um, I want to be in the, my work to be in the tape. You know, you'd have this idea and then the older you get, you just realise um, it's not what it's <laughs> cracked up to be and hardly anyone sees your work anyway. And if you have a private view, I've had one when I used to make like, like ob objects and things like when I did my MA, only a handful of people will turn up and hardly anyone will come over and speak to you about your work. So yeah, I've got a very a sense of realism about what what like 
a photo zine or a photograph can do um, and how like you know you think of it as a democratic thing but it's like realistically it's not going to change the world but yeah it's still nice to, to you know to have these intentions yeah and also just get to give um, a sense of kind of value and importance to people's stories that yeah might not necessarily be that visible like their kind of work life um, yeah. that aren't aren't documented and um, yeah um, and we've a conscious of time but I think we have a little bit um, more time for one question maybe um, so yeah I just wondered kind of um, about kind of yeah are there any photographers that you're looking at um, now who are currently who you feel like are currently kind of challenging representation particularly of working class life and um, yeah and any kind of plans that you might have for the future as well yeah um to be honest i haven't been since i've uh, handed in my phd i've sort i've haven't been like looking at academic things or i haven't really been like you feel like when you're in academia you're always you do things because you've got to write about it and this that and the other but it's like i don't actually get to see lots of exhibitions or and i'm not I've got like a few select really good photo books that I think, well, I've done this research. I'm going to try and have my own collection of British photo books that represent British working class people, but I don't hunt them down or anything like that. Um, I've been, um, I t told you, I've ended up, what I'll, like when I wrote me conclusion to me PhD of what I wanted to do next, the thing what um what I really wanted to do was collaborate with like sociologists or anthropologists um to to make work um because I think you can only go so far with like it's like I'll run out of people and now who can ask can I take can I take a photograph of this and that and I think that's one of the main problems with documentary photography unless you're a like street photographer and you photograph everything but I sort of am motivated by having a deadline and a purpose and and that's that like motivates me and so I have been lucky enough I am I've actually just worked on a project with like an educational psychologist who wanted to me to take photographs um the work uh, around the ten boroughs of Manchester to sort of reflect the backgrounds of the children they're doing their research about and so that for me is the ideal situation but um, what made me think about wanting to work with sociologists and things like that was looking back at old um, the far have you heard about the farm security administration with them um, Dorothy Lang, do you remember Migrant Mother? Yeah. Well, that was part of like um, Roosevelt's new New Deal. Was he um, paid photographers to like document all of the poverty of all these farmers, like unemployment and you know a lot of poverty? Um, but that was part of that project. But her husband was um, a, he was a sociologist, and so the they made this photo book but he provided sort of the, the writing with it and so I've looked at a lot of books that have made, been made collaboratively um, and I like um, John Berger and Jean Muir, I don't know whether I pronounce his name properly but they've made co like collaborative books with um, John Berger doing the writing and Jean, with Jean Muir's photographs brings that added dimension to it and so yeah, I'd, like that's what I want my future to be is like working collaboratively with people. Um, so ho hopefully after I've nearly finished this project and working on with MMU, but I hope that I will get to do more of that type of a type of work. Because um, I do think it's such a shame that people, there must be so many people who like study at PhD level and then finish and then you know unless you can 
find ways of continuing with your work it must be very you know it's very difficult and i can imagine some people end up just doing normal jobs or jobs that you know that have nothing to do with the research so just um fingers crossed i, I do get to carry on yeah no that sounds really interesting and kind of um how photography can be used like outside the kind of art bubble as well to yeah. maybe like affect policies and that kind of thing yeah so really interesting yeah um, well yeah I think we're probably out of time but uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much um, for kind of talking us through your work in such depth and kind of how you approached your work um, it's been lovely chatting with you um, and hear more about it and so I just want to say thank you very much and thanks to everybody for joining us for the talk as well. Yeah and can I just say thanks everyone if you can hear noises in the background it's drilling next door it's not me <laughs> trumping. <laughs> yeah. Cheers thank you. All right thanks. All right.